From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. (sighs) Demonic possession. It's a hot-button issue for many people, uh, skeptics and true believers alike. And many of us listening along today have perhaps experienced some things they cannot explain. In tonight's interview segment, we are returning to stories of possession and, directly, stories of exorcism. Now, before we dive into our conversation, we want to air the following disclaimer. This does include discussion of faith, and we do not interrogate people's faith. As we always say, your spiritual beliefs remain your own. But fellow conspiracy realist Matt Knoll and I just recently heard perhaps the best investigation of exorcisms that we have ever heard in the world of podcasting. And so we wanted to ask the creator himself about this show. Please join us in welcoming Ryan Bethay to the show. Thank you for coming on the show, Ryan. Thank you for having me, y'all. It's exciting to be here. Ryan, you you do a lot uh, in your world. We we have here some writings about your uh, the various things you do. You're a producer. You're a writer. You're an entrepreneur, so you, you do all kinds of different things. Can you just describe to us your previous work before creating The Exorcist Files? I like that punt to me. That's good. That was good. Um, I, uh, um, so yeah, I, uh, as, as I'm a self-proclaimed entrepreneur, producer, and writer, whether someone else calls me that. Although you just called me a creator as well, so I might, might yeah. adopt that. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been in uh, film and TV for a long time. Um, pod, this is actually my first podcast of this type. And if you, the funny thing about this entire journey is that if you had asked me 10 years ago, would you end up investigating exorcism? I would have accused you of being possessed. Uh, this is not something I plan to do, <laughs> um, but I'm just, I'm bas- I am a marketer by trade. I love sales and marketing, and I love just helping people find the ability to tell their story. That's fundamentally what we do. The irony of this whole thing is, despite how dark of a podcast this is, um, I actually make most of my income making comedy videos for brands. So there is a nice little you know, by day versus by night. So I do have a Bruce Wayne sort of Batman thing going on here. If Batman was like more upbeat. Right, right. Classic emo superhero, Batman. Uh, <laughs> billionaire. Oh, That's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Minus the billionaire. Uh, and we've, Minus the billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> well, for now. Uh, so we've, we've uh, also been looking at some of the, some of the previous work you mentioned. Watch what your kids watch. Scary fans. You know, the dinner disaster, which is on YouTube. Please check it out. And uh, a lovely, a lovely conversation series you have with celebrities in a ca- around a campfire. And you're right. Ten years ago, from at least what we understand, it would have, it would have seemed odd that you would create one of the best deep dive examinations into Catholic exorcism on the planet. And, and, and you have, could you tell us a little bit about the origin of the exorcist files, your initial inspiration? Like, did you have a personal upbringing in Catholicism? Did you have a standing fascination with saints? So, what makes this interesting is that I did not grow up Catholic, uh, and I'm actually not a practicing Catholic, um, which I also do think lends a certain uh, objectivity to it that makes, I think, shows up in it. And I do have to give a shout out. Obviously, um, this podcast was made possible by two other people as well. Um, the notorious uh, Father Martins, uh, whose case files we actually share, and our illustrious editor, sound designer, mixer, co-producer. He basically did all the incredible sound design and also all the research and just did such a phenomenal job, Chandler. 
uh, who you all know. And, uh, it was such an awesome, uh, collaboration, but I, uh, did not grow up uh, particularly religious. And the way I got into this whole thing is actually probably more interesting than the podcast itself. So I actually originally was fascinated with the concept of miracles. I've always been interested in these accounts of miraculous things that have no explanation. Like when the doctor's like, you had a tumor, and then the imaging shows that a week later, after some prayer session, there is no more tumor. And I've heard of these stories from very credible people. Um, And I'd seen some of the medical imaging myself. Very rare. But um, what I actually discovered was, as I was researching this, the Catholic Church has a process for which for the canonization of saints. And to be a saint, you have to have these miracles associated with you. And there's an extraordinarily rigorous process that goes into determining whether or not a bona fide physical theological miracle. So it can't just be you accidentally got a physical miracle. It's actually got to be tied to intercession or prayer uh, with that particular uh, would-be saint. And, um, and so I, got, I managed to have a, a, a meet someone who was very connected at the Vatican, flew out there and uh, with another uh, producer friend of mine. And basically, that's funny, we were waiting around a hotel room. We never knew. It was sort of like a CIA meeting. You don't know when you're going to be called in, when you'll go. We were walk- escorted into this room, and this priest uh, basically said, you know, I, I don't think you're going to be able to do this miracle show because the medical records are very hard to get. And I said, well, that's unfortunate considering how far I just flew out to Rome. Maybe a, a call would have sufficed. Uh, but he goes, but <laughs> would you be interested in speaking with someone who is one of our top exorcists and experts on spiritual warfare? And I went, yes, that sounds great. So <laughs> he, he gave me Father Martin's information. I called Father Martins, and you know what's interesting? I didn't know this until about three months ago. I assumed we hit it off right away. He has shared now multiple times uh, in panels that he thought I was lying and had stolen his number from somewhere and was trying to get to him so I could get his case files. So I called him. He said, where'd you get this number? Um, Because obviously exorcists are, you know, usually hard to get a hold of, understandably. You know, they get a lot of inbound calls. Uh, So uh, he... uh, he then uh, he called up uh, the Holy See and asked this priest and said, did you give out my number? He's like, yeah, I really like this kid. I like his vision for what he wants to do. Hear him out. And so Father called back and he goes, I don't know what you did or how much money you bribed or whatever. He's like, but man, you got something. He's like, they're asking me to take you seriously. And so I said, you want to do a show about exorcism? He's like, no. I went, okay. <laughs> um, Father, do you think Ouija boards are dangerous? Absolutely. Do you think the occult is a reality? I do. Do you think that satanic abuse and dark forces are at work in the world today? I do. Then why don't you tell that story? Let me help you tell that story. Um, and let the, let the listener decide. And he goes, all right, I'll give it some thought. And it took a lot more convincing. I'm condensing it for our listening enjoyment. But uh, it took uh, quite a few sessions with me to get him to uh, relent. But finally, he said, all right. And uh, I'm so grateful for how it turned out. Um, we just couldn't have asked for a better team. iHeart was a great partner. And uh, yeah, you've, you've heard it. It is the weirdest stuff. And of course, the first time you meet an exorcist, you immediately ask him, what is the strangest thing you've ever seen? And he shared a few things. And I said, I think we can work with this. So that's how it started. Wow. Can we talk about some baseline stuff when it comes to exorcisms, the state of, or at least the way Father Martin's views um, the functionality of things like heaven and hell and earth and, and all of that. In the second case that you cover, Father, Father Martins talks about hell, like where, where hell is or what hell is, the nature of hell. Can you tell us a little bit about how he views it? Yeah, so... Uh, one of the interesting things too about the podcast, right, is so it is told from a Catholic uh, priest vantage point, but we do try to take great pains to present a contrarian, agnostic, and even the Protestant side, because while Protestants and Catholics will definitely converge on a lot of theology, they do diverge in some significant areas. So we really wanted to create something that was like open to a lot of folks. So uh, in particular for Father, just to oversimplify, um, is that uh, hell is an absolute reality, Um, that God is very real and that the world is, he once said this to me and I thought it was very well put, was that the world is charged with far more spiritual activity than you could ever understand. 
Um, he also takes great pains to say that um, for Christians, um, they need not fear the enemy. You need not look at it um, as being something behind every bush. And actually, he really does agree with C.S. Lewis's famous quote about the two great mistakes that we make when it comes to spiritual warfare are one, to see it in everything and to give it too much attention, or the alternative, which is to ignore it completely uh, at our own peril. So uh, he very much kind of falls in that with that line, which is the, you do not need to, when you get in your car, be afraid that you're going to be encountering demonic forces. Unless you live in Los Angeles or Atlanta, and the traffic, of course, is uh, particularly... <laughs> oh, play into the hometown crowd. You know, but I mean, there's some tough traffic that you have to deal with, right? But uh, sure. so it is a real thing. And one thing to factor in, too, is the cases that we profile, he deals with some of the most extreme cases that by the time they reach him, um, they are particularly serious. And so this is not your you know, sort of average run of the mill, uh, someone who may or may not think they might have some sort of ghost troubles or spiritual issues. Um, so it is very real for him. Um, he thinks it is definitely on the rise. Um, I actually, I got him to, to weigh in on this prior to this episode. Um, he's actually in Hong Kong right now, um, uh, on, on a trip. And, um, he said that, uh, he fundamentally believes it is it is true. The exorcisms are on the rise, that demonic activity is on the rise. And he believes that is because of a uh, moving away from traditional uh, religion. Um, and so he, in his worldview, that believe, that leads to a increase um, in sort of that activity. And there's just a fascination with the occult. Um, you're seeing this uh, in a lot of places. The one thing in that episode that really struck me is, Ryan, how you compare instead of thinking about hell as a physical place that is, you know, somewhere below us or, you know, with somewhere, some physical place somewhere, you liken it to uh, the matrix where uh, the devil and demons in the same way that God has access to the entirety of it, right? Like um, an a the way an agent infiltrates a person who is in the matrix is similar to the way a demon can infiltrate a, you know, human being on earth because it's not as though they are in a physical place in hell. They're existing almost as an overlay of the reality that we encounter. That was fascinating to me. Oh, the matrix is really interesting. So I, again, I don't think this is probably intentional and I'm sure there's some shortcomings for the comparison, but I, I love the matrix as a uh, metaphor for the Christian worldview, because the idea is that, um, you know, without following God and without sort of stepping into what we are fundamentally designed to be, that we're all sort of asleep and we're sort of, you know, bought off by worldly pleasures, just the ordinary, just, you know, passing time. And that, if you are plugged into that, and if you, and so in, in, a, in essence, um, and I think Father would agree with this, if you do not have the Holy Spirit as taught by uh, Catholic can, uh, and Protestant theology, then the enemy has much more free will and can move in and out. Um, and so essentially, you're still hardwired into this matrix. But the moment you're liberated, the moment that that Holy Spirit uh, imbues a person, uh, they're severed. And now agents can still cause problems. As we see when you're, because we're if we're dealing in their dimension, um, or if they come into ours, but uh, they can't hijack you uh, in the same way, which I found which was really interesting. And I just also love the idea of uh, you know someone saying you know do you want to know what the reality of the world actually like is something ap is there something actually wrong and you know it deep down inside, um, and it is it is really cool. And I think I want to make sure too. One thing that comes up on this is that. So much of demonology and hell and all stuff, a lot of this is conjecture. I mean, they're educated guesses. There's wonderful intellectual tradition and theology. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff that I deeply uh, agree with, but a lot of this is guessing. You know, it's funny. We get a lot of emails from saying, you know, what about this? And isn't it true this? And I'm like, I have not been there, thankfully. I've not visited hell. Uh, do never want to go. Uh, and so I cannot speak, um, and I've not talked to the tourism board, so I cannot speak with any authority <laughs> on what it is uh, yeah. uh, specifically. Yeah, that's that's the um, that's that's something I think that's uh, key. There's a there are a couple of there are a couple of large misconceptions that the global public has about the Catholic uh, the Catholic practice of exorcism, right, or the Catholic philosophy of possession, uh, as well as you know something that the show readily acknowledges other cultures concepts of possession and exorcism what would you say are some of um in father carlos martin's view what would you say are some of the common 
public misconceptions about how an exorcism actually works. Yeah, totally. Um, and uh, so the biggest one is the way Hollywood portrays exorcism as this equivalency battle. It's basically a shouting match of who can can the priest get out just the right amount of really verbose Latin and just the right amount and shout it down before a plate flies off the wall and hits him in the head. And it's this like battle of two sort of equal but opposing forces. And so he will tell you that, uh, no, I mean, one, uh, based on the theology, that's not the case at all. Uh, the demons have already lost, right? And their whole job in this point is to just try and wreck things, try to make your life tough, and remain as long as they can. They know they're losing. It's it's a, like a caged animal that's been cornered, right? And all they can do is lash out. So stuff happens. And he will tell you that the phenomena witnessed in the exorcism, minus the head spinning, he's very clear the head spinning he's never seen he also thinks that would sever the spinal cord and end the exorcism pretty the, quickly. The exorcist, <laughs> the film. Yes. The exorcist, the film, based on the novel. Yes. So he says the crab walking, spitting, levitation. That was like my first question I had to ask him is, have you seen this? He goes, absolutely. And I went, okay, we have the makings of a show here. Uh, but uh, no, so the biggest thing is it is not a just sort of like Dragon Ball Z battle, right? Where you're just like throwing opposing forces at each other. So uh, <laughs> he's walking in there and he's issuing commands. He's not talking to it. He's not engaging in conversation. He issues orders and commands based on the priestly authority uh, that he has. And the suspense and the drama of an exorcism is the psychological battle to actually identify uh, the wounding or doorways or gateways that this thing got in. And so a great example might be... Oh, to remove uh, the jurisdictions, yes, right? Yes, to remove the jurisdiction. So everything, he would say this, and um, you know, from my research too, this is I would back this up, is that it's all, demons are highly legalistic. Everything is about permissions and orders, right? Do they have permission to be there? And it is about, and that's where to exercise and remove those rights. That is what is happening. So he's essentially saying, no, you don't have that right. The demon will shout out, say, I can be here because of this. And he'll say, all right, person, do you repent of this? Have you, can you get rid of this object, right? Do you confess this? Whatever it is. Then it's removed, and he says, no more. Now you don't have that right anymore. And then by that order, then eventually the demons uh, have to leave. So that's where I think the biggest um, misconception is. And I get it, because it makes for a great movie, but it's just not accurate. Also, the big one, if you really want to get father fired up, a priest would never, ever, ever ask a demon, take me instead, like that's that's the big issue with that film. He's like it's just because there's that's a surrender. It would not happen. Uh, he's in charge when he walks in. There's still nerves, right? Because the person has to participate. He can't do it on someone who's not a willing participant who doesn't want to be liberated. Um, so there's some drama there. But overall, yeah, those are those are probably the big two. We're going to pause here for a word from our sponsor, and then we'll dive deeper into the Exorcist Files. And we've returned. Let's dive back in. To quickly play devil's advocate, which never seemed like a more loaded term uh, than in this particular conversation, uh, is there a part of this um, this exorcism activity that is akin to therapy in some way? Because it would seem to me that there are examples that maybe could be seen as potential demonic possession that are actually just serious mental illness. And perhaps even, you know, in a church-sanctioned situation like this, there might be examples where there are both of these things at play. That is a great question. Um, and honestly, the main thing that fascinated me with this. So I came to this because I do have a spiritual word, a worldview. And a, another way to put it is like, I don't subscribe to a wholly naturalistic worldview. I also don't think most people do either. I think if we're really honest with ourselves, everyone accepts truths that they can't verify in a lab. Like we love each other. We believe in rights and, uh, you know, uh, values that are not conferred by nature. Uh, we all agree in consciousness and thoughts, but we can't, we can't prove a lot of this stuff. And so um, I do come into this very open in the idea. And also the big thing for me too, that I think has to be stated is that, you know, and we, we, we document this in our research, but it seems like every culture throughout all of history has some sort of reality and paradigm and prescription for how to deal mm -hmm. with demonic spirits. Uh, and evil forces. Mm -hmm. Like it's just been a reality uh, for so many. And it still is in a lot, a large part of the world. There's a lot of spots where it's very real. The witch doctors and, um, and, the, and you know, kind of 
the practice of the occult is, is still very real. So I come into this too wondering, well, is this mental illness? And father will say this, and also one of the contributors to our show, uh, Dr. Richard Gallagher, brilliant, brilliant psychiatrist, uh, Yale trained, uh, teaches at Columbia. Um, they both said uh, that most cases are in fact just mental illness, right? It is very difficult to get an exorcism in the church for good reason. One, it's usually not spiritual. Um, mental illness is a real thing. And thankfully, uh, the church, and I'm talking about the, not just the Catholic, but there's been a broad acceptance of psychology and mental health and therapy as a wonderful tool uh, to help people. Um, and so, yes, there are many cases where it probably could be explained. And sure, you go back in history, I'm sure the first time or before they had a real paradigm for Tourette syndrome, I got to imagine people just thought like, oh my gosh, like that person, you know, has that. But here's where it really kind of breaks your box, right? So this is a question I've had to ask myself. Let's grant, let's, let's, let's grant for a moment. Let's play a little Morpheus here. Let's say there was an immaterial timeless, meaning outside of time, like ethereal embodiment of evil that was like this personification of evil that had a legion, no pun intended, of helpers set to dismantle and completely disrupt this like unfolding plan that God had for his children. And, and the second they're discovered or the second a person comes into contact and says, oh my gosh, this thing is real, it immediately validates the existence of the supreme being would you make yourself known or would you hide? Would you obfuscate? Would you completely make people think that this is complete hooey? This is like, all of this is just psychology, psychological in your head. So if you think about it, and if the theology is true, if, if Satan and his minions are real and there is an intelligence there, it makes to me absolute logical sense that if it were real, they would try and hide behind this. And what we've seen in some of these cases is that the two are not mutually exclusive. One could very much suffer from epileptic seizures. One could suffer from schizophrenia um, and have multiple personality disorder and also be afflicted spiritually as well. And a demon might choose to capitalize on both those. So I'm with you. I come into this inordinately skeptical and assume, and that's why I appreciate that the church makes it difficult to get one. They have three classic signs that uh, you guys have talked about in previous episodes that have to be there because the other ones, you know, just being averse to religious objects, you can fake that stuff, you know? And if you listen to the show too, you will find that father has these little fascinating diagnostic tests that he uses, like flicking holy water on their back when they're not looking, um, reading fake. Can Latin. we talk about that? Yeah, of course. Let's talk Let's about the holy water. Uh, in the second case, it's Jeremy the firefighter, and yes, as we're going through and learning about this case, as a listener, I'm thinking, oh, this dude is just going on drug benders because he's not talking to his <laughs> wife for like days at a time, waking up in different places. Like, oh, this dude's just on drugs. Totally, that's what's happening in my head, right? Till we get to the moment where he's sat in Father Martin's office or wherever they are, and Father Martin's is showing him like books, I think, kind of distracting him as almost like as an illusionist, and then walks around behind him with holy water, flicks it on Jeremy's back while Jeremy's not looking. And at least according to Father Martin's, this guy has a, like, could you describe the reaction? Oh, yeah. So uh, he basically is, and he'll do this with a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, victims that have come in or people seeking help. Um, and yeah, so he will distract by, you know, moving books, et cetera, you know, saying he's very busy, et cetera. Oh yeah. Tell me what's going on. Tell me what's going on. Right. And then he walks around and he just drops this water that he had blessed. He had whole, he keeps holy water on his shelf, which, you know, as an exorcist, I would keep holy water close to me as well. And, uh, Jeremy just, I mean, flies out of his chair. According to father, he just lets out this shriek and just like profanity. And, you know, I'm sure father in that moment is like, interesting. Um, Cause there's no <laughs> way he could discern. The other thing he'll do is he will read fake Latin. Like he'll translate an ESPN article into Latin and then <laughs> he'll see if he gets a reaction. If he starts getting a reaction to a reading of the, you know, nationals or the Braves season stats in Latin, he'll go, probably not a genuine possession, but if they, then he'll switch, he'll stop and he'll start going into an actual prayer. And then if the person just like tenses up, et cetera, he goes, uh, it's like, Oh, we got a live one here. Uh, so I, again, 
to if we're gonna if we're gonna poke holes in the show, right? This is we are taking a priest stories according to him, and we're just recounting them. I was not in the room. I have not seen these personally, and I think that needs to be absolutely stated. This stuff we've not I've not seen footage of this. Um, the best we can do is take his stories. Um, and then also, uh, go around and talk to other people. And I think for me, what ultimately lends so much credence to this, and as y'all have probably heard in the show, there's a lot of other experts that have weighed in. And these are, again, you can disagree. You can say, maybe you got it wrong and maybe did, maybe they did, but these are sharp people. These are smart, credible people who are not under any pharmacological, uh, assistance that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, diplomatic and sincere, Ryan. Um, I, I, I'm really glad that you brought up some things. There, there are a couple things I want to go back to, but before we do that, let's go with the present. Let's talk a little bit, not just about the intersection uh, between faith, science, and objectivity. Let's talk about the team that has made this show possible. You and Father Carlos Martins are working with, of course, our pal, full disclosure, Chandler Mays, we know him well. Uh, your team members also, that you mentioned a bit, include scientific advisor Dr. Richard Gallagher and Professor Joshua Brown. These guys are big, big deals in their field. Now, what um, what would you say they play in the series? Like, how, how do you interact with them, knowing that uh, the audience itself may be listening without being um, practicing Catholics, right? Maybe being very skeptical and not believing in Catholicism whatsoever. Uh, how, how did they help you guys bridge this, um, bridge this purported chasm between the scientific and the divine? For sure. I mean, obviously, to make the show stronger, we wanted to talk to other people. And there's actually a few um, contributors, and all of them played a special role. Uh, The main thing is, is they would, you know, with Dr. Gallagher in particular, and I encourage everyone to read his book, Demonic Foes. If you're fascinated with this topic um, and you want a really good beach read for people to walk by and see you reading, uh, that's a good one. (laughs) But, um, you know, so one, you take folks like Dr. Brown and Dr. Gallagher. Um, So Dr. Gallagher, he is a very eminent psychiatrist. I mean, he studied classics and graduated Phi Phi Beta Kappa, I think is the, I'll mix, I'm not at that level, where I can't even pronounce the Greek uh, superlatives that associate with his name. Um, But he, (laughs) and actually I was just rereading some of his book this morning as I was prepping for this, right? Because he came into this extraordinarily skeptical. And it was only after witnessing some phenomena where patients started speaking languages that there's no, I mean, you don't just pick up Aramaic. You know, you know, and there's, I don't know Rosetta Stone Aramaic that I'm aware of. Um, you know, he started and then he would just find credible people and he'd go, this something strange is happening. And he actually has one story, uh, that he shares, which, um, if we have time to, I might come back to cause it's, it's a gnarly one, but I also want you to, to support him and get his book. Cause it's a, it's crazy. And when he, I, I, so I interviewed him and he was phenomenal in being able to say, look, this is what I, he's like, I know mental illness, right? He's like, look, most of these patients are not spiritually possessed. That is not the case, but he's like, but as a psychiatrist of practicing for decades, I can look at someone and I know the difference between schizophrenia, right? And delusions and someone who has bruises appearing on their body out of nowhere, who is ex- exhibiting incredible strength and speaking Russian all of a sudden when they're not Russian and have no exposure. He's like, I know the difference, right? And I've seen that phenomena. And so I think having someone of that academic caliber, just say, look, You know, and again, you can disagree. All of this is totally so much of this is I get so crazy to to hear. But then you take someone like Dr. Josh Brown, who shared a testimony right now, his case, he actually has medical imaging to back it up. It's not a true or it's not a traditional case in the sense of uh, possession. But here's a guy who's not Catholic, who basically experienced uh, had a brain tumor and a miracle, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. So he basically was, and I, again, I encourage everyone to listen to episode six where he shares his testimony. He was essentially though, one morning, his wife um, had a dream that there was a name afflicting him, some sort of, and she wasn't sure if it was a, an entity or whatever says this name Uh, ask him, does this mean anything and pray? And he just erupts and starts having a seizure. And again, you could look at this and go, wow, this, so you ended up having a brain tumor. You got diagnosed brain tumor and you could go, wow, a brain tumor totally can correspond with epileptic seizures and result in this sort of symptoms. But the fact that it happened at that exact moment with that name, right? And then 
not until um, he was went through a prayer session months later, and then the thing st- and then he got delivered, and it started shrinking and shrinking until eventually some scar tissue just remains and it's not there anymore. His is a great case, and I love it so much because there's uh, always plausible deniability. It totally potentially could be explained in the natural, but then you just run the you run the odds and you go, what are the odds? They got prayed for that that name was said, and then all of a sudden this thing that was told was not going to get better just got small and small and then eventually vanished. And so you end up in a situation where you collect enough of these stories and you go, something's happening. Uh, on a final note on the contributors, um, we had um, a woman who is the wife of a very well-known pastor share a story of chronic illness for 20 years. And it wasn't until a relative of hers went to a fortune teller and the fortune teller said, you have a curse on your family. And she went, what? A curse? She goes, yeah, you have a curse on your family. And it's afflicting the firstborn female in each of your generations. And she goes, goes back, starts looking back through their family history. And it's, I mean, she goes, Ryan, it's one by one, just cancer, early death, debilitating illness. And then um, they finally go and they see an exorcist or a a deliverance minister, um, as we're more known in in the Protestant world, does a session, instantly healed. And could feel everything leave, and she'll look at you and say, "And now she's been healed since." And so, and she, I know her. I know this person. She's wonderful. Like this is not. I mean, she had accepted the illness. So, on one hand, I just say, "Look, question for sure. Come into this. You decide. Be skeptical, and then just rejoice with the fact that, regardless of whether you agree with the means and the method, uh, a lot of these people are now happy and healthy and no longer afflicted by whatever." was causing the problem. So the contributors just really, I think, lend a nice um, credence to it. Um, you know, just that add a little extra dimension than just father, you know, other smart people saying, yeah, what he saw, that happened. Well, that certainly has the feel of the type of biblical curse that any of us that uh, grew up going to Sunday school would be aware of, the idea of the firstborn or, you know, things oh, of yeah. that nature. Uh, it really does kind of fit that format like a, like a glove. Uh, we're also aware of what type of self-fulfilling prophecy a curse can be, right? For like sure. So, like, the psychology of that is so intense and can be so intense. It's fascinating because you can see... I love I love The Exorcist Files because it really does allow you, me, again, as a listener, I'm just speaking for myself here, a space to really go back and think for yourself about stuff. Like, even your preconceived notions, the things that you go into the show feeling or thinking you know you can really explore them in there because you, you guys allow for that space, which is really cool. I, I'm loving it. Oh, well, thank you. It's, um, and I think, you know, and it, it, the team did a good job because everyone on the team disagrees with someone else on the team about some of their theology. So I really love the sort of trifecta because not like, you know, Father and I don't agree on everything. Lord knows Father does not agree with everything I agree with. Um, but, you know, we really wanted this to not be just proselytizing. We want to say, look, you know, there's a re- uh, And honestly, Father consider- considers it a win. If you don't touch the Ouija board after it, uh, or you don't touch the, uh, you know, if you decide not to go visit the shaman or the you know, witch doctor, he considers that a net win. Even if you don't agree with Catholicism, he just wants you to say, look, this is the reality and this is what I've seen. And these are his experiences. And I think obviously you all do such a great job on this show. I mean, you live in, you live in the blurriness, you live in the, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that can't be explained. And I just want people to keep an open mind that like, I mean, isn't existence just gnarly? I mean, honestly, when I started doing the show and I was like, this is, <laughs> put that this on a t-shirt. Is, Sandra yeah. would say yeah. existence yeah. is itself. But hell. It's, no, it is. Yeah. It's just gnarly. But when you think about like the fact that like we all exist on this perfectly sized rock, like the, a distance sure. from the perfectly sized star and like, Shh. and then you get into quantum theory and you go, <laughs> no. like, I mean, it just, yes. it really starts blowing your mind. And that's where I started going. If someone's like, dude, you're insane. Like, this is nuts. There are no such thing as demons. And I go, like, you might be right, but how about this? Like, sure. We can't, there are so many things about the universe right now that like, and you get into quantum there and then you really start and you're like, oh my gosh, like, is it really that far-fetched that there could be something else going on 
that like that we just don't have an explanatory framework for? I mean, tell me it's not possible. Seen through a specific cultural fr- framework. No, like this is how this is how we encounter stuff. The more the more that human civilization learns about the nature of reality at the very macro and very micro levels, the more it seems that this kind of Goldilocks middle this just so planet with this just so gravity and this just so mix of chemicals, the more extraordinary it seems. Like uh, w- one thing that um, one thing that I believe we all love about the Exorcist files is this very even handed, this very even handed exploration of this man's experience, of the father's experience, and and Ryan, one thing that you guys do so very well is humanize this right a lot of people will get turned off maybe because of their personal prejudices when they enter into a conversation or an exploration about something considered supernatural and hearing someone you know uh, recount their stories as an expert that might not reach everybody in the crowd one thing that you guys do very, very well is humanize it through recreations. And let's talk a little bit about this because there is, for anyone who somehow hasn't listened yet, The Exorcist Files includes you and Father Carlos Martins speaking in depth about specific cases of possession and exorcism. And those cases uh, are depicted uh, through recreation. Could you tell us a little bit about the choice to do that and how you and father negotiated those depictions? Absolutely. So it's, uh, you know, so originally, so when we had this and I first, you know, optioned these cases, the dream was film and TV. We wanted to start that. And then this tiny little thing, um, this pandemic thing happened. I don't know if you all remember this, but uh, the country, the, the, we kind of shut down and uh, that really put the kibosh on uh, doing, you know, anything with film and TV. So we were, because we had shopped this around and we were excited and having cool conversations. I mean, it's exorcism, you know? I mean, no one's, it's a family like, wait, you're working with who? And I'm like, yeah. And it's, uh, and so we, um, I actually had kind of reached a point, and this is part of the cool story. I had shopped it around and we had gotten a lot of interest. And then when pandemic hit, we were just like, it was clear. I just, no one knew what was going to happen. And it was a scary time. And I was like, I don't know what's going to happen here. Right. And true story. I had a friend and this is why I totally believe power of prayer. Um, this, I will stand here and just say, I've seen this. Like I had a friend say, call me up and say, Hey, I was praying for you. Um, and I just wanted you to know that I feel like God told me to connect you with someone. And I was like, okay, well, I'm, you know, it depends on who it is, but I'm usually pretty open. <laughs> you know? uh, um, sure. I'll meet a friend. Right. And she's like, yeah. And, um, I just think it's someone you should meet. And so I was like, great. So I connect to this person. We have a nice chat just about like life in general. And uh, we're all just mutual friends. And uh, she happens to work at this little fringe podcast network called iHeart. I don't know if y'all have heard of this, um, but uh, very, very, very small, very, you know, boutique, boutique podcasting network. <laughs> and, uh, and she goes, you know what? Have you, con- have you considered this as a podcast? And I was like, I mean, yeah, not, not immediately, but ultimately she's like, I think this would be a great podcast. And she's like, let me connect you with some folks over there. So I went to work and just put together a little pitch. And I decided I loved, um, I loved old time radio as a kid. My parents would put me in the back of a forerunner and we would drive around at night and just the old like sheet metal for thunder, you know, just like footsteps, you know, <laughs> really on the mm-hmm. nose dialogue mm-hmm. because you have to tell where people are like, Hey, you know, MC Bravo, what hey, are you doing over there? Knows. Oh, that's right. Or like, Ben, what are you doing over by the water cooler? Um, and, uh, I loved those and it was so fun and so spooky. And so I was like, I want to do this, like recreates old time radio drama. And then, so we pitched it right away. They were interested and it was awesome. And so iHeart was an amazing partner. And then they assigned us this like, you know, of course, insanely brilliant, uh, engineer, editor, everything, include everything, right. Who goes, why don't we do this in 3d binaural? So uh, the aforementioned, uh, Darth Mays said, I think we can do this <laughs> in 3d binaural audio. And I'm like, 
that sounds really cool. I don't know if I can say binaural. And he's like, yeah, it'll surround sound. And I'm like, that's awesome. I did some research and I was like, oh, well, I mean, it's, I don't know anyone who's really done it that way. And he goes, no, no, we're going to do it live, like found footage. And I thought, that's awesome. Let's get out there. And so he <laughs> picked out this 3D mic. It was also insanely difficult. If you really want to have a fun story is ask about the number of leaf blowers that demonically appeared out of nowhere right when we hit start. <laughs> so we went out and have actors. These are actual actors uh, recording, moving around, creating these sets. And one of my favorite stories is um, we were filming episode one, which um, not to spoil anything, but one of the women as she becomes possessed starts screaming profanity and it was 10 p.m. at night, and we were in Burbank. <laughs> and uh, she's running out the door as her husband flees. And so we have several takes going, where, I mean, 10 p.m. at night, and going, no life without death, like screaming <laughs> at the top of her lungs in the neighborhood. And I'm just, just, just white and just terrified. I'm like, this is so bad. Um, and Chandler's like, that was good. Let's get another take. You're recreating demonic possessions with one of these? Yeah, yeah, show the show the ears. <laughs> no, yeah. it's the ears, but like I'm just I'm imagining how creepy that is that you're pre like playing characters getting possessed and being in the state of possessed with actual looking ears as the thing listening. There's something demonic about that. There's it something is. symbolic at least. Yeah. How did how did Father Martin's or how does Father Martin's feel about these recreations? I, I gotta admit, right, I'm a bit surprised. Um, when, when I'm listening through, when I'm talking with you and Chandler, I'm a bit surprised, uh, that Father Martins had nice things to say about the accuracy <laughs> of the film, The Accurate, uh, The Exorcist. So what did, uh, what, what did he think of these recreations? Well, remember, he had nice things to say, albeit one massive, like, ruining plot problem. For no headspins. So, no no, well, no, uh, oh, no, no inviting the demon yes, in. Never, Father never. Karras yes. is, is in No priest there. would yeah. ever do that. No. So, um, so he gets very, it's fun to watch the things that get Father riled up, you know, and that's one of them. <laughs> um, and bad scotch. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, hey, if you've spent all day casting out an ancient serpent, I mean, you need to decompress. I think, I, you know, he deserves it. But um, should be a Scotch commercial right there. Oh yeah, welcome back That's to a good idea. Discerning the spirits with Father Martin's, you know. So, hey, there you Cut, go. Cut, Brent. You heard it here first. You got it there, uh, folks. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So he he speaks. Um, he speaks in a very approachable way, and Father Martin's here is. He's not really talking down to people at all, which uh, I think we all appreciate. Uh, he's he's not condescending. He's not overbearing. He's a person who's been through a great deal of things, and he's talking quite honestly about them. So I think one of the big questions that a lot of people hearing the Exorcist files are going to have is, did he did he approve of these uh, of these actors depicting this story or these stories? It took a long time to build trust uh, enough with. I mean, because he he knew the big risk he was taking. He was forever seeding his anonymity, um, and his life has fundamentally changed. I mean, his phone is ringing off the hook. Um, he has had people. I mean, and my inbox, or I should say, the inbox for the show is filled with emails, with attachments, which I will not open. <laughs> People saying, do you think this is cursed? Do you think this is possessed? Um, I checked my Norton antivirus and it doesn't include a provision for spiritual protection over my email. Um, but, <laughs> or uh, questions about relics, I imagine. Yeah, or relics. Yeah. But no, it took a lot of, um, there was a lot of trepidation at first and I was nervous too. Um, and one thing Chandler did a great job uh, doing is because he has such a wonderful ear for that. You know, I mean, I, I knew a lot of the actors. Um, a lot of them were friends of mine. It's very cool. Also very disturbing to see your friends. Uh, we had one actor who plays the murder demon in episode five, which I think is probably the best episode. of the, They're all great, but um, he ends up, uh, I remember we were, you know, holding the mic in front of him and he was the demon playing murder and he creaked his neck to the right and you could hear on the audio recording the snapping of his vertebrae, like in the, like a chiropractic adjustment. And Chandler, I looked at him, that's all like that guy, he just nailed it. And it was like, 
you came to play. So it was cool to see your friends do that. Father didn't actually have a chance to listen. I mean, because that wasn't his role. He just had to trust us. And um, once he heard the first episode and he was like, whoa, this is really cool. Uh, Because we were all nervous. I was excited. And I will admit too, I had a crisis of faith. We had a few reviews come in early on that said, recreates are silly. I don't want to do this right. And then it's funny. It's such a good lesson not to judge anything too quickly. And then days later, just hundreds pouring in saying, this is amazing. And now we've got thousands of reviews saying, you know what? I didn't think recreates would work well. Um, but it actually does lend an authenticity to it that is really cool. And so, so grateful we ended up sticking with it. Um, and uh, Father, he, he actually, he loves that. And it's fun to see him as he gets more involved in the process too. The inner filmmakers coming out uh, and the you know, recording, like, could we try it with this? Could we try it with this? And, um, you know, it's, it's really fun. So it's, been, it's become increasingly more collaborative with him. And, uh, and it's just, uh, just a blast. Well, that's the thing, though. I mean, recreations sort of have a bad rap because they're so often used ham-fistedly, <laughs> and they sort of are associated oftentimes with sort of hacky material. Um, so it's really all in, in how you use it. It can be as great or as you know poor as as you as you make it. And, and you guys absolutely knocked it out of the park. It's funny when you see some of the runnings. Like, there's a scene where a guy is running away from a witch, and he's carrying the mic and sprinting like eighty yard sprints at a time, yelling. And so, I, I would love. Um, to show people one day, just like all the behind the scenes of like what you heard and what's actually happening, uh, in the moments. And you're like, this is just, this is so trippy, uh, to like see all this stuff. And, uh, there's so many talented actors. We had over 45 actors involved in the process who, you know, I mean, this was a very, this wasn't the most expensive production. And so we were so grateful, uh, for the people that came in to do it and uh, the locations that were donated. So it was really, it was really cool to get out there. And it's also fun for people to explain to the, we had one gal who was uh, just out of college and she was telling us how she was explaining to her mom and dad, the first big break she got in her acting and her parents like, what are you doing? She's like, Oh, I'm a possessed girl. And we're like, great. Mm, that's, yeah. that, that's, that's on, that's on, that's on point. Uh, that's good for you. You know? All right, let's take a quick pause, hear a word from our sponsor and then come back with more from Ryan Bethay. And we've returned with Ryan Bethay talking about the Exorcist files. Also, also speaking of behind the scenes, Ryan, I would I would posit to you that uh, the Exorcist files is kind of the first ever behind the scenes of exorcisms and possession in Catholicism, right? In this medium, I, I'm thinking in particular of some of the bonus episodes that have come out, which we found extraordinarily fascinating. I'm thinking in particular of Exorcist Addenda, which dives deep into the ideas of relics, the idea of how a saint can be beatified and canonized demonic hierarchies, which is of a special interest to us for some unrelated matters. Uh, and <laughs> the, and the, uh, okay. the, the, well, moving on. So yes. the, uh, so fa- father Martin's is, um, and father Martin's aside from being a, an active working exorcist also is intensely involved in the world of reliquaries and relics. Is that correct? That is correct. He is affectionately and quasi inappropriately referred to as the relic guy. Uh, but he does have, um, and I don't even know what you'd call it. It's not a collection, um, but it's a, he has a, uh, he has in his, on his person, some very cool relics and does these tours where people come to um, adore them, I think is the correct terminology and to, uh, reflect on their meaning, et cetera. Um, and he's said that he's witnessed and heard lots of crazy testimonies of cool things happening. Um, I, I, on the relic side, what was interesting is obviously we feature that in one of the episodes where he brings out the relic um, or a friend of his, he had shipped a relic to that was intimately tied apparently to this demon's past. This demon had been responsible for the murder of a saint in the past and hundreds of years ago. And he just happened to have a relic from that saint. And so we brought that exorcist on who was in the room that day and said, can you describe what happened when that relic was put on the demon? And he said, Ryan, it was the most horrifying shrieking, like this thing, hell broke loose. And I, and it's funny because obviously relics. So 
from a product, and I come at this from a Protestant angle and not from a Catholic angle, like relics are not talked about. They're not something that is at all discussed in uh, Protestant circles. I will say though, to be fair um, to Father on the Catholic side, like it is mentioned in Acts. They say Paul's, the Apostle Paul's garments, um, pieces and shreds of the garment were sent out um, and they healed people and they drove out demons. And so that tradition continues uh, in the Catholic Church. And uh, he has some fascinating objects that uh, are purported to contain some power. And you know what? It's funny. We've researched and I've heard from several people, um, friends of mine, um, unrelated to this show, who have had experiences where they got an object or a, a, a sort of token at some market in a different country and started experiencing some problems afterwards. So it really doesn't, I know it's a little different, but it doesn't surprise me that we, it seems like a lot of people accept the idea of like cursed objects. So the idea of an object that had confers or is imbued with some holy, uh, you know, power and has been, you know, and is tied to, um, you know, God shouldn't actually be that big of a surprise. Right. So it is, it's fascinating stuff. And I mean, there are certainly uh, massively famous, you know, artifacts of this nature or, or relics that, you know, appear in pop culture, like the Ark of the Covenant and, you know, the Shroud of Turin and things like that. So, I mean, it's interesting to see functional kind of discussions of these things outside of some sort of like cartoonified, you know, Marvel version of these things. That's right. And the Dial of Destiny, I want to be clear, is not a relic. So... For, no, for it's based on the Antikythera mechanism, That's which right. at best would be a relic of secularism. That's uh, right. That's right. The, so um, I just wanted to be also, in case anyone was curious. <laughs> <laughs> also, also, I do want to give a uh, big shout out. This is this is such a dumb shout out, right? But I do want to say, uh, I believe it was the first bonus episode, Exorcist Addenda, where we have one of my favorite puns. Which is, let's Turin the page oh. <laughs> in a uh, Shroud of Turin reference. So uh, this is also a hashtag no pun left behind show in some parts. Uh, and that's, that's another thing that I think is very human about it. And it's not stuffy. And it's not um, looking down. It's not, it's not ex- attempting to uh, invalidate people's personal experiences. Uh, there's there's another fascinating bonus episode, which is just a Q&A. Uh, it's like a listener mail episode with you and, and Father Martins talking to the audience. Now, you said you guys already were at a, uh, what does Reddit call it? An RIP inbox state with, uh, with all the all the co- correspondence you've received. What kind of questions have listeners been asking you all? Oh man, um, great one. So the number one question we get, or early on we got is, what's a podcast? Uh, where can I watch this? Uh, which was really interesting. Um, so we had to actually explain. Um, I was actually shocked because you think like podcasts are pretty, pretty ubiquitous by now. There's a lot of folks who don't do podcasts or they don't, they don't even know where you'd get one. Uh, so that was interesting. The second question, this, and I'd say these two account for 70% of all questions that come in, is will I get possessed listening to your show? Um, I mean, there's a what? huge amount of, yeah, oh, yeah, huge amount of fear um, to the point where if you go on our website, we actually have a disclaimer under the Q&A. No listening to this show. I mean, one, Father Martins would not intentionally put you in harm's way. Um, so, you know, give him some credit. But two, like, no. And then also, again, going back to the what if, right? Like, what a brilliant strategy. If there was an enemy like this, right? And he scared you into the point where you couldn't even learn about it without endangering yourself. Like, that would just be brilliant. So I found that really interesting. And so we often would have to respond and saying, look, if this is real, if the spiritual, if the Christian worldview is true, and you are a Christian, um, I got to be honest with you, you're already under attack. Like, don't worry about it. This is, this is not the, and there's worse stuff you're listening to probably, you know? Um, so I, I think that's, those are the big two. And then we get a lot of really specific questions about, can you interpret this dream for me? Um, can demons read our thoughts? I got that question so many times. Um, Cause sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's hard to extrapolate exactly what, you know, what I really appreciate about father is he does a good job of saying, this is what is official doctrine. This is what's my experience. Right, and one of the beautiful things I have to say this because obviously the, the, I think a huge portion of the audience is probably is Catholic, but um, there's some significant 
theological differences between Protestants and Catholics. Um, and to the point where I even had some Protestants ask, like, hey, are, how are you comfortable propagating his actual views? Um, and I have to say, uh, it wasn't a mean-spirited question, just a sort of like, hey, generally, like, because, you know, there's some differences. And I was like, well, Father and I really together decided, one, obviously, these are his stories. So these are his experiences. Decide what you want. But two, let's stress the commonality. And here's the commonality um, from both those worldviews, which is like, hey, you don't need to be afraid of this stuff if you're doing the right things. And two, um, you don't have to get a Catholic exorcism, which I really appreciated Um you know, granted, he believes that is by far the most effective, right? And a major exorcism is not to be undertaken by anyone but a but a priest. But you know, I really appreciated the dialogue about, hey, like you know, because uh, people will write in and say, you know, well, can I, I went to this pastor, or this this denomination, you know, is this okay? You know, am I am I still possessed because I didn't get a Catholic one? And Father was really good about saying, look, you know, if you are baptized in Christ and you genuinely believe right? All believers have the authority, according to the Christian tradition, to cast out demons. That being said, he believes his experience, the that the rite of exorcism, the Catholic version and theology is the correct one. Um, and then he would, in good conscience, recommend them there. But I think there's a cool tension where you can listen to it. And I, I love getting emails from Protestants and even atheists. We actually had a Satanist write in and say, you guys did a great job of capturing. This is exactly how we operate. And I went, thanks. How'd you get my email again? (laughs) (laughs) A deistic Satanist. That's somewhat rare. Okay. Nice. Well, let's talk about really quickly, guys, the, the, the first exorcism, I think you were in the show. You guys talk about the first recorded exorcisms and like how far the tradition goes back, how long ago the rites were created. We go back to like 1614. We go back further. Um, Father Martins talks about how the rite of exorcism that's used today was created 500 years ago, and it's been you know modified over that time. But if you take it all the way back, you can go to the New Testament to Mark and read Mark 5, where Jesus exercises a demon, where he takes a, um, a legion of demons, around 2,000 of them, at least according to Mark, pulls them out of a man, puts them into pigs in a field, like literally 2,000 pigs, and then those pigs run down and drown themselves. Like, that's, that's nuts. I just have to say it. I can't believe that. It's a rough day for that farmer, too. No one talks about that guy who owned all yeah. the pigs. <laughs> that was a lot of food. He lost all that stuff there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Father will observe that a lot of the, I think, I could be wrong on this, too, um, but I think a vast majority of the stories about uh, the demonic in the New Testament, uh, which, to your point, Matt, like, it's the most talked about slash not talked about thing in the New Testament. Like, there's prayer, there's, you know, there's angels, there's, I mean, you got all sorts of stuff in there, but the miracles everywhere, but Jesus does, you know, a few exorcisms, and it's understood that this is a reality, and the, the disciples at one point come back, because he gives them the power and they to cast out demons, and they come back, and they're like, Jesus, you won't believe it this works. Right. And he's like, I know guys, but yeah. don't be, don't be excited about that. That's not the most important thing. Be excited about the fact that you're saved. You know? Um, but it was, yeah. but most of the stories actually take place near water, which was an interesting observation. And so father has postulated there could be some connection between the demonic and water, which, you know, could even strap extrapolate further. There's water and baptism. And is there some inverse relationship? You know, one of the theories that actually, I don't think it was, fa- it may have been, fa- someone put out this theory that um, the wire salt and water and some of these like elements uh, or these like materials um, used in exorcism. And one of the theories that got thrown out was that these represent original jurisdictions that Satan and his demons had dominion over. And so uh, using it against them is like God's sort of justice against them. Like, oh, you were you were in charge of the salt of the earth and you were to oversee water, you know, and, uh, and now you forfeited that jurisdiction. And so I will use it against you as a constant reminder of the rebellion. So I can't prove that, but it's kind of epic. It's fascinating. Back to the idea of lawful evil alignment of jurisdictions, right? The, um, the idea of Satan as uh, an ubiquitous entity, non-corporeal, dwelling at every moment in time, right? 
and only allowed in uh, when when certain invitations are made. We're alluding to some things, folks. If you want to hear the full exploration, tune in to The Exorcist Files. It's available now. A lot of the episodes we're talking about that we barely touched on, including some deep dive bonus episodes for which we're all grateful. Ryan, what... If we're being as general as possible here, uh, it's clear that this is for anybody interested in the concept of exorcism, not just people of the Catholic faith. What do you hope the audience can take away from experiencing the exorcist files? I'm going to answer that, but I'm going to make you a deal first. I need some legal jurisdiction here because I want to ask you guys, too, if I can put you guys on the spot, too, what you all think about some of this. Please do. I've I've been monopolizing this uh, for a lot. Um, But I uh, so one, you know, uh, this isn't the primal thing, but one, I I hope people at the core, at least they're entertained. I love making things that help people be entertained. But more importantly and far more importantly is that um, I want to raise awareness of the idea that um, spiritual warfare could be far more real than people realize. And regardless of your theology, your worldview, your outlook, um, and again, I'm biased, right? I'm not a naturalist. Um, I think there is abundant evidence. And I've just, and again, we're all shaped by our experiences, right? I've had, prior to doing this show, I had several friends in college share a story with demonic encounters, the three guys who don't know each other, um, but they're all just friends from college, who have almost the identical experience. Long ago, I was like, I think there's just, there's stuff that's going on. There's stuff that can't be explained. And I want people to open their minds and say, just for a moment, consider this, right? And if it is real, how would that change some of the decisions um, we make in general? Um, And so I hope people can at least walk away. Also clarifying some of the misconceptions um, about it. A lot of, I know there's a lot of wounding and a lot of people think it's just a wait. you know, it's a, you know, I think when people think of this, sometimes they think of just like, you know, inquisition and witch trials and just like people being burned at the, you know, that there's, there's of course throughout history, a lot of mania. And I'm sure a lot of people were throughout history were very much falsely accused of this. Right. But uh, I'd love people to know that there's also, um, if you really dig in and find out the, the reality, at least from our priest perspective is that, um, a lot of people get healthy and this is another tool. Like Dr. Gallagher says too, is like, as a medical practitioner, I am obligated to bring forward any methodology that could be therapeutic for my patients. And if this happens to be one, so be it. Uh, and at least let's be open. Let's be open to it. Um, and so I want people to just, cons- just again, have the conversation and say, could there be a spiritual reality that I'm not aware of? Cause I do, I do accept truths that I don't have physical laboratory verified evidence for. And if what would and what would be the implications of that? So on that note, I would love to know. Y'all have listened to obviously some of this. Thank you, appreciate it. You were you were the four extra downloads we got yesterday. I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm curious, like you know, where do you all live with this? As far as like, would you listen to it? Do you just is it sort of a blurry tension of like, you know, because you guys cover all sorts of crazy topics, and this this could probably be lumped in with UFOs and everything. Like you know, what do you you know? Do, do you think there's evidence that there's something else going on? It's tough. I mean, like you said, we we sort of are uh, stewing in a lot of this type of thing on a regular basis, like day in and day out. So it's hard not to uh, walk away with the sense that there is something deeper, you know, than we can see and then we can, you know, figure out and actually fully experience, you know, uh, to the point of... Uh, you know, scientific evidence or t- to, to be based in some sort of provable thing. And I think if you discount these types of ideas, then you're sort of living only a partially um, rich life, you know, whether these be negative phenomenon or positive phenomenon, spiritual, demonic, you know, uh, forces beyond our galaxy, forces beyond this kind of mortal coil. Um, it's a long-winded way of saying, you know, as like a, a non-monotheistic person myself, I absolutely am with you in in having a spiritual belief. I don't know what to call it, though. Um, and I certainly think that some of the things that you uh, describe in your in your show um, really do f- cause one to take pause and and give a little more thought and credence to these kinds of things beyond just a psychological phenomenon you know so uh, yes 
<laughs> I do think there's something. I uh, don't know what it is, though, um, but I, I, I remain open to it. I love it. Diplomatic, erudite, well thought out. That was great. It was good. Well, well I'll, just, I'll, I'll just give you an experience from today when I was listening to one of the episodes. One of the characters, I think his brother brings home a, a Ouija board set, and they're like teasing him. Their little brothers, a little kid, and they're teasing him about it. And they get him to use it, and almost immediately, the little brother is like, "No, nah, I don't. Mm, I'm not going to do this anymore." Goes upstairs, is like going to bed, and according to the story, he gets visited by some darkened figure that is so dark it makes the darkness look light. Uh, I think that's how it's described in the, in the episode that I listened to, and this thing apparently has a cat's head. It's like a man with a cat head. So then I opened up uh, the Lesser Key of Solomon to check out some of the demons and how they're described in there. And Baal is described in that thing as having sometimes appearing with a cat head. And as I'm going through, I'm like reading about that and then comparing it. And it's just, I think for me personally, the show is is making me want to explore it further, uh, not even knowing truly what I you know, believe about it, but it's certainly fascinating because it makes connections to other materials that are out there and that are available. Hmm. Now that's, you know, it's, that story, that, that story bothers me actually, is that it seems like the kid doesn't like he did the right thing. He left, you know, mm-hmm. now obviously he still makes a deal. Right. And so that's the, um, and that's the thing, like we can say that doesn't seem fair, um, but again, if God is who the Bible says he is, then, you know, he ultimately will be found fair, but it's, it's such a, that story does bother me a little bit, but again, he makes the pact, but yeah, it's, uh, another crazy thing. So that you describe it, the shadow that is there, but not there, that is darker than darkness. So when I mentioned the several people that I told you about, um, in college, that was something that really stuck out to me because, and again, they just dismissed it as like, man, you know, too much to drink that night or whatever. Right. But like, um, one of them actually said that he was reading a book, uh, the teachings of Don Juan, um, and had, uh, which, you know, that definitely is probably the, you know, if you're going to point to a book that could be maybe the, the beginning. Yeah. And, um, he said he, uh, he was awake, he was sleeping at night and this is a common, common experience that people write in about. So, and again, I, this also, uh, you know, could be tied to some, physiological response humans have. I know that in our sleep, we often are, you know, can have this uh, sensation of, you know, suffocating, you know, with apnea or sleep paralysis or whatever. But he described waking up and this shadow being in the corner of his room, the room being freezing and it coming over and hovering over him and jumping on top of him and saying, submit, like pushing him down. Uh, we document that story uh, or a story like that in the Exodus files. I have two friends who have that exact same experience and a third with just a slight derivation of it. And that's the kind of stuff that makes me go, okay, is there something in the human psyche that just, that goes to that, that manifests that kind of like when they say, I was joking earlier, but you know, when Chandler would make the joke that he sees the shadow people after going, being awake for two days, like maybe that's rooted in something, right? Maybe there's something going on there. But again, you hear these stories and you go, okay, how come it's always the story of like jumping on the chest and saying submit. And you're just like, that's creepy. You know, I don't know what's going on there. So I'm, that's kind of the stuff that I walk away going. When you hear stories, the father tells that line up with stuff you heard years before you go, that's one of the reasons I find him particularly credible. Ryan, would you, would you be open to us inviting our fellow conspiracy realist uh, to write to the exorcist files with their own experiences? Absolutely. You're welcome to write. Uh, we do have so many emails that are coming in right now. Um, but please like, just be patient, uh, with us. Uh, cause it does, uh, there's a lot of attachments coming and I got to clean out the inbox. So yes, yeah, so if anyone wants to write in and share, we do try to read as many as we can. We obviously can't get back to everybody, um, especially in a timely manner, but please, uh, exorcist files at Gmail. You can follow us on Instagram for the latest updates on the very, uh, tantalizing season two. You think you've heard some crazy stories already, Season two, going to blow your mind. So just when you thought it was safe <laughs> hey. to go back in the room. <laughs> <laughs> right. Throw away your Ouija boards. And yeah. also, if you if 
For those of us who would like to learn more about your work outside of the Exorcist files, I'm thinking of stuff like Assembly 72. Where where can they find you directly? Yeah, so one, you can follow me on the gram. I'm the Bethay. It's not as pretentious as it sounds. It's just the and then my last name. Um, and then you can follow us, obviously, on Exorcist Files at Instagram as well. And then, um, uh, yeah, you can also reach me at uh, ryanbethay.com uh, if you want to ask questions. Or I love connecting with folks and happy to help with anyone's... Uh, uh, within reason, obviously, we can't. It's funny. Father has gotten such a big increase in house call requests, and he just can't do it anymore. Um, so it's kind of Ghostbusters, you know, the ad ran on. Um, so on there, but yes, no, um, definitely. Um, and then please actually, uh, go to exorcistfiles.tv, sign up for our email list. We have some really exciting updates coming about season two. So please go to exorcistfiles.tv. Um, and then you can engage with the team on social media as well. We'd love to hear from you. We so appreciate it. The show's doing great. Uh, grateful to iHeartRadio. They really helped make something special. Chandler crushed it and grateful for y'all having me on this you know, I would have made a great extra. See how much I talk. I could have just the demon would be like, please, if you just be quiet, I will uh, leave. Send uh, me to the pigs. No. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank, you, <laughs> thank you. The demon's thank like, you please. so much for your, <laughs> thank you so much for your time, man. We're not casting you out. We gotta keep this one, right? What do you think? Matt, Noel? So say yes. we all? Oh, we say. I love it. Man. You know, at the at the end of that, I feel like we all still have a lot of questions. What do you think? Yeah, nothing wrong with questions. I think they're important. They're what makes us human. One of the one of the things that is. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed that conversation and appreciated Ryan's um, commitment to spirituality and mm-hmm. to you know keep that kind of top of mind for him and his perspective but also his willingness to you know go elsewhere go wherever the conversation and the thoughts might lead and the questions and such um respect and objectivity right exploring such a personal charged thing and um in the case of possession and exorcism something that is often woefully mischaracterized in fiction. And I say that as a big fan of basically every exorcism horror movie on the planet. Oh, yeah. Uh, You know, guys, I came away from this really wanting to somehow, some way, get access to Father Martin's, I guess, his files. Because he's, he's apparently got a whole transcript of the actual case. that They called it the Roland Doe case the one that the exorcist book was based on and with the actual, you know, person's name with the full details of what happened. God, I would love to read that and other like transcripts or recordings of actual exorcisms. God, I want to see that. I was asking, uh, I was asking Ryan also off air what the off, off the books conversations with father Martins had been like, you know, in the creation of the show, because uh, this guy is one of the world's foremost experts on exorcism. Uh, We hope that you found this conversation as fascinating as we have. And like we said earlier in the conversation, please do check out the exorcist files. We're not blowing smoke. That is a very well done show. It ticked the boxes Mm -hmm. for me, you guys. Yeah. And once again, big ups to our buddy Chandler Mays. Um, excellent work uh, on the production side and research side and all the things side of this show from him as well. And if you are uh, possessed of something that you want to tell us, uh, you can exercise your right to contact us at any number of platforms across the internet. Hashtag no pun left behind. Indeed. You can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram and TikTok. Use your voice. Call 1-833-STDWYTK. Leave a voicemail. You've got three minutes. Give yourself a nickname and let us know if we can use your message on the air. It's that simple. If you don't want to do that stuff, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com.
Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.